WNBC in New York. Just John Primus in the morning. It's 9 a.m. NBC Radio, news on the hour. Robert Kowalski reporting. Elite South Vietnamese troops have entered Quang Tri City. Earlier, they had recaptured two nearby district towns, the first to be reoccupied in Saigon's counteroffensive. Late reports from the embattled northernmost province say South Vietnamese paratroopers, together with their American advisors, had pushed to the southwestern edge of Quang Tri City. Initially, they'd encountered virtually no resistance, but now they're facing a heavy line of fortification. How many men who listen to me tonight have served their nation in other wars? How very many are not here to listen? The war in Vietnam is not like these other wars. Yet, finally, war is always the same. It is young men dying in the fullness of their promise. It is trying to kill a man that you do not even know well enough to hate. Therefore, to know war is to know that there is still madness in this world. Uh, I, I landed on uh, the 6th of June, D-Day, 1970. They uh, flew on, over on uh, the uh, Flying Tiger Airline. We circled uh, Tonsonut Air, Air uh, Base for a while because they were getting mortared. And uh, when we finally landed, I got to the door of the aircraft. That hot, humid South Vietnam air hit us. And it was first the, the heat, the humidity, and the smell uh, just slammed into you like a brick wall. The, uh, there was jet fuel, the uh, burning uh, feces, and just everything. And then as we uh, disembarked, uh, there, a lot of the uh, American troops were there saying that they were short timers, they were on their way home, and we were all gonna go home in body bags, which was their own sort of sick humor, which we learned how to go and say the very same thing too as time went by. It, uh, but it was, it was a real shock to be there. What am I doing here? <laughs> um, it, it's kind of uh, unusual because you're coming from a civilian environment. You just realize that within the last three to four months you're in college and now you're in a foreign country thousand miles away from home. Uh, you start adjusting to the temperature. You start to learn, as they'll tell you, you listen to the guys that there were before you because they had the experience and you're a boot and you don't know what's going on. And you kind of draw, if you're really smart, you draw from their knowledge because they've been there longer than you. You start to learn what the smells are like, the sounds are like. And when I say sounds, it could be anywhere from a bombardment far away to a sand pan going right next to you in the river. So you start to learn to adapt to the environment that you were there. What have I done? <laughs> it was hot. It must have been 100 degrees. And you could hear uh, outgoing mortar rounds in the distance and it's like what have I done let me go home <laughs> so far over 2,000 men have died in the war in Vietnam many gunned down in the fields rice paddies and jungles or killed in bombings as the US military presence grows in South Vietnam so do civil tensions in America as more and more young men are being drafted into service for a war fought in shades of gray. When the draft was reinstated during World War II, it was for a different war in a much different world. With the Axis powers threatening to engulf the world, a 1940 draft elicited a staggering 71% approval rate. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's signing of the Selective Service Training Act on September 16, 1940, made it mandatory for men 21 to 35 to register with the Selective Service. Upon America's entry into the war, it was changed to men 18 to 65 years of age to register, with those 18 to 45 subject to military service. Selected through a lottery, draftees were to serve for a full year 
period extended that October. 10,110,104 men are drafted through the course of World War II. More than half that number volunteer. As the Cold War begins in the 1950s, Selective Service drafts 1,529,539 men to serve in the Korean War with 1.3 million volunteers. Vietnam is a less popular war. I didn't join up. Uh, I got drafted. I was pulled off the street and getting ready for the summer of 1967. And I lived on the Jersey Shore and I enjoyed myself up there. And I got the letter in the mail. Congratulations. You have been selected and the rest of the story is history. Even though draftees are a minority of Armed Forces members during the Vietnam War, they initially make up a staggering 88% of all infantrymen known as grunts. Because of this, the mortality rate is high amongst hardly trained draftees, making more than half of the deaths in battle. The Vietnam War is unlike any conflict before it, especially from a racial perspective. Integration of African-American soldiers into the U.S. Army begins to change from black-only units to integrated ones with the Korean War. While President Harry S. Truman ordered desegregation of the armed forces in 1948, the final all-black unit is not ended until 1953. The Korean War is the first to follow Truman's new policy in action. Two African-American Army sergeants earned the Medal of Honor during this war, Sergeants Cornelius H. Charlton and William Thompson. The war in Vietnam brings a fully integrated military, but not a fairly integrated one. African-American soldiers make up 12.6% of soldiers in Vietnam from 1965 to 1969, and mostly as infantry. Because of this, fatalities among black soldiers is at 20% of all combat deaths from 1961 to 1966. Selective service offers deferments to current college students and those in essential civilian occupations, a qualifier that, in itself, favors middle to upper class whites. Draft boards are also primarily white, with African Americans making up only about 1% of all draft board members. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. describes Vietnam as a white man's war, a black man's fight. Protests against the draft come in October 1965, when the monthly draft number significantly increases from 3,000 to 33,000. A common form of protest is a burning of the draft card. Heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali is one of them, refusing to join the armed forces on April 28, 1967, citing religious reasons. He is sentenced to five years in prison, fined $10,000, stripped of his title, and banned from the sport for three years. An appeal keeps him out of prison, however, and the case is overturned by the Supreme Court years later. Ali's protest will bring further attention to the draft problem, one that affects the younger generation in the U.S. and will lead to civil unrest. To combat the stealth of the Viet Cong, the U.S. Army employs an herbicide and defoliant to clear the jungles of natural camouflage and also deplete their crops. It is called herbicide orange, or HO, but more commonly known as Agent Orange. Well, the, the big thing was about Agent Orange is how it got its name is from the orange band on the containers. Noting the success the British had with Agent Orange in the 1950s, President John F. Kennedy 
authorized the start of Operation Ranch Hand, designed to blanket enemy territory and battlefields with the chemical. One of the things I thought was very interesting is on our vessels we had what they call evaporators, converting salt water into fresh water. And when you were in Da Nang, which was our home base in um, uh, Camp um, Tinshaw in Da Nang, they would come around and want to know if you want water, and they would have what they call these YOs, which was a Navy vessel to put water aboard our ship. And he, he would always refuse it. Uh, he would not take it. He would always use the evaporated water, converting further out to salt water, to fresh water. And I've often wondered if he knew something about Agent Orange, because that was one of the biggest things, guys were coming down with Agent Orange. And he wouldn't take any of the water that the regular Navy was supplying to us. In 1969, a study will reveal health hazards linked to 2, 3, 7, and 8 tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, an extremely toxic dioxin compound. The U.S. Army will continue to spray Agent Orange until 1971. Agent Orange contributes to General William Westmoreland's war of attrition his plan to overwhelm the enemy through the might and superiority of the American armed forces. He hopes to inflict insurmountable losses to the limited North Vietnamese and Viet Cong through a combination of ground forces and air support. His search and destroy missions are about to become a point of contention in how the war is fought. January 24th. 1966. The largest search and destroy mission at this point in the war is Operation Masher, a sweep coordinated with the 1st Cavalry Division, South Vietnamese and Korean forces through the Binh Din province. Located in the south central coast of Vietnam, Binh Din has been an important base for the North Vietnamese command. The goal is to not only flush them out, but decimate their supply areas. The first cavalry is faced with the dilemma of Viet Cong intermingling with local villagers, severely handicapping their ability to openly use force. You know, the Mamasans would come in and do our, do our laundry. Uh, we had a Papasan that came in to go and empty out the uh, uh, drums from our outhouses. Uh, turned out uh, that Papa San was, was a VC and uh, he ended up getting found out and arrested. I, for whatever reason, he was, you know, a VC informer. We took care of everybody that came through our doors, and a lot of them would be Vietnamese. They were always very polite to us. Our interpreter, of course, was Vietnamese. We had a Mama San that shined our boots and washed our uniforms. A lot of the ladies that cleaned the nursing units where the patients were were Vietnamese, uh, we had a pretty good relationship with them. Some of the Mama Sons would tell us when the VC were going to be in the area and to be prepared. There was no hostility that I was aware of between the women, at least with the women and the nurses. I never went into the village or anything like that. I figured there was enough chance of being killed uh, without going into the villages and so I, I would do at least one thing that was safe and stay away. <laughs> Leaflets written by the U.S. Army's Psychological Warfare Office are dropped, warning villagers that if they do shoot at U.S. aircraft, the Army will seek out and destroy them. Another leaflet urges Viet Cong members to surrender and gives them a chance to return to the South Vietnamese cause. It promises government payment to help support the VC member and his family. Now, I worked the POW unit and that was a different story. Please tell me about that. <laughs> Basically, they were VC or suspected VC and they were not too happy to be there. If there was a firefight and VC were wounded, the American sold, we would take, dust them off. But because the South Vietnamese government wouldn't give them medical care, we took them in, stabilized them before we turned them over to the South Vietnamese government. Of course, I think our military intelligence talked to them first, very nicely, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, 
we stabilized them, nursed them, and took care of them until they were able to be turned over to the South Vietnamese government. And they were not always too happy to see round eyes. Quan Sit Hut at the 85th, and I had a North Vietnamese first lieutenant at the very end who played chess all the time with the MP. And then the MP took one Viet Cong out to the outhouse. We had outhouses to do his business and forgot that, he, you know, and came back in because it was so hot and forgot that the Viet Cong was in the outhouse. And the next thing we know, we heard the, Viet, the Vietnamese yelling and screaming because he went out of there. So I think the MP was a little bit embarrassed that he had left his prisoner by himself. <laughs> Luckily, he didn't have an opportunity to run away. It is clearly a psychological ploy designed to not only spare innocent casualties, but to also diminish the morale of the Viet Cong. Disturbing is the conduct of the South Korean soldiers. They perpetrate both the Bin An and Tae Vin massacres. Unarmed civilians of both villages are killed by the soldiers, 1,200 in Tae Vin and 380 in Bin An. Such atrocities will become synonymous with the war in Vietnam. President Johnson, mindful of potential public outcry over Masher's name, has the operation renamed from Masher to Operation White Wing. At the end of Operation White Wing on March 6th, there are 2,389 enemy casualties with 1,342 deaths. The U.S suffers 288 KIAs and 990 wounded, while Korea and South Vietnam lose 10 soldiers in action. On the first day of Operation Masher, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara recommends boosting U.S. troops to more than 400,000 by year's end. He doesn't believe that bombings and deployments will end the war. The temptations of the Vietnamese nightlife, particularly in thriving cities like Saigon, include drug use, prostitution, and alcohol. As troop concentrations increase in the early days of the war, so does venereal disease. From 1965 to war's end, VD is the top diagnosis in all soldiers at one and four soldiers. Fifty percent of all soldiers affected come from Saigon or two other base camps. Gonorrhea is the primary VD at 90 percent. Luckily, it only requires hospitalization for only one percent of all its cases. It is still a rate higher than any previous war. March 26, 1966. As American involvement increases in South Vietnam, the most highly organized week of protests to date begin in five cities, New York, Washington, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, and San Francisco. The National Coordinating Committee to End the War in Vietnam arranges the protests. An estimated 30,000 to 35,000 march down New York City's Fifth Avenue alone. But the anti-war movement really didn't start until Berkeley. It started as, you know, it started with the free speech movement, which is, I've got a whole slew of theories on that, where that comes from. It's, you know, Mario Savio, comrade Mario Savio started that. So we, we can say anything we want. We have freedom of speech. So you're going around using the F word back in 65. You didn't do that. They'd lock him up and they'd get out in the spring. Anyway, that was the forerunners at Berkeley of the uh, anti-war movement. And, um, and I could go on hour and hour, hours and hours where it, it came from, because we heard it all over there and probably knew more than anybody except deep cover uh, intelligence CIA, but. I didn't understand it. I didn't appreciate, you know, I couldn't understand why people wanted to uh, be so negative against the soldiers. But now that I'm older, I can understand it because I'm not so, 
hot about us being in Afghanistan. So I guess the way I feel about being in Afghanistan is how they felt back, you know, during that period about being in Vietnam. They are to be far from the final protests against the war in Vietnam and a harbinger of the civil unrest that will come to define the decade. January 10th, 1967. President Johnson, in his State of the Union address for 1967, despite social criticism of Vietnam, stands firm that American troops will maintain a presence until North Vietnam aggression ceases. Until such efforts succeed, or until the infiltration ceases, or until the conflict subsides, I think the course of wisdom for this country is that we just must firmly pursue our present course. We will stand firm in Vietnam. know that our fighting men there tonight bear the heaviest burden of all. With their lives, they serve this nation, and we must give them nothing less than our full support, and we have given them that. Nothing less than the determination that Americans have always given their fighting men. Whatever our sacrifice here, even if it's more than five dollars a month, it's small compared to their own. How long? How long it will take, I cannot prophesy. I only know that the will, the will of the American people, I think, is tonight being tested. General Westmoreland perhaps feels tested after establishing American forces in Vietnam he is ready for the next step, an offensive against the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. The strongest area to attack is War Zone C, known as the Iron Triangle, for its three boundaries. This 155 square kilometer area is between the Saigon River, Tan Dien Forest, and Song Thi Tien River. South Vietnamese forces refused to enter this dagger pointed to the heart of Saigon, just 20 miles from the capital city. Operation Cedar Falls will be the largest ground operation of the war, a search and destroy mission formulated to decimate enemy presence in the area and done with no warning to the citizens of Vietnam. Under his command are an approximate total of 30,000 U.S. and South Vietnamese troops, with the South Vietnamese focused on the civilian population and villages while the U.S. engages the enemy. The greatest challenge that Westmoreland and his forces face is in the guile of the Viet Cong. They have enmeshed themselves in villages, creating their tunnel system and using the terrain to their advantage. The use of defoliants and 60 bulldozers will make short work of the concealing vegetation to hopefully eliminate that strategic advantage. U.S. units will line the Iron Triangle along two sides under the guise of routine deployment and then converge in a hammer and anvil tactic, scouring for the enemy and their bases. The Viet Cong headquarters is located within the Iron Triangle in the village of Ben Suk. In 1964, the Viet Cong drove the South Vietnamese army out of the village, executed its leaders, and took Ben Suk over. They didn't just conquer it, but made Ben Suk an active part of their operations. Westmoreland plans to change that. They assume strategic positions on January 5, 1967. Ben Suk is a village of about 3,500. It lacks electricity, and its population lives simply. Uh, they would come in. Uh, they had very, they had little medical care, so 
sometimes people they only only time they ever saw a doctor or a nurse and we would give that most of the time it was to clean wounds uh, cuts uh, give out antibiotics that type of thing basic medical care and they seem to be pretty grateful for that civilian population I kind of felt sorry for them um, when I wasn't doing anything on the guns, I was in charge of the ammo section and trash. I'd make the trash rounds down to the dump. And just looking at some of the people, how they, oh, they gorged themselves on our food that we threw away. They dug into the dumps. They got the clothes that we threw out. And like I said, the food we threw out, they were deprived. And they didn't have any of this stuff. It was all new. In fact, the funniest thing, we were up in Quantree, up north, and we gave them soap. And then all of a sudden that soap come flying back at you with teeth marks in it. You couldn't eat it. They didn't know what soap was. That was one of the funniest things I ever saw over there. Vietnam is very beautiful. And um, if you put aside the smells, there are temples, uh, beautiful flowers, uh, jungle. It was a lovely country, mountains. It looks like Hawaii in many respects. It was just it's a beautiful country. And you look out South China Sea, blue. Um, it was a paradise in a lot of respects. By the end of Operation Cedar Falls, the villagers of Ben Suk will be forced to lead entirely different lives. One of the programs that the South Vietnamese and the United States Navy was working with is to train their cadets, their officers, be the equivalent of people going to Annapolis here. They put them aboard our vessels, and even though they were cadets and not commissioned officers yet, they'd have to work with the enlisted men to learn different things. So we had experience with them. One of the biggest problems we had is probably communications with the language. Um, you may have uh, four or five of these Vietnamese officers or cadets assigned to you, and only one could speak English. The action starts at 0800 hours, three days later, with an air assault on Ben Suk. U.S. forces surround the village with minimal resistance, letting a South Vietnamese battalion search the village. They uncover a tunnel system and many supplies. The Viet Cong agents found are only low ranking. The entire village is migrated to the now overcrowded village of Phu Loi. The longest and greatest system of tunnels is only 20 miles from Saigon in the Ku Chi district, a full length of 20 miles. The will of the American people is no longer being tested, but now challenged as protests intensify and the younger, hippie generation opts to preach love and peace rather than simply protest war. On January 14, 1967, at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, California, the Human Bee Inn is a gathering of the hippie counterculture who reject so-called middle-class morality and war for a radical liberal approach. Hippies focus on the concept of free love drug use, communal living, a sense of ecology, and a total rejection of war. It brings around 30,000 and cements the hippie movement in the public consciousness. That summer, near 100,000 young people descend upon San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury neighborhood and turn the area into a virtual hippie commune. The hippie counterculture is in full swing. September 29th, 1967. This evening, I came here to speak to you about Vietnam. I do not have to tell you that our people are profoundly concerned about that struggle. There are passionate convictions about the wisest course for our nation to follow. There are many sincere and patriotic Americans who harbor doubts about sustaining the commitment that three presidents and a half a million of our young men have made. Doubt and debate are enlarged 
because the problems of Vietnam are quite complex. They are a mixture of political turmoil, of poverty, of religious and factional strife, of ancient servitude, and modern longing for freedom. Vietnam is all of these things. Amidst this social change, the public's perception of Vietnam starts to slip with the questioning of the war's purpose by the younger generation, as well as the media's portrayal of the war, weakening the government's justification for the conflict. President Johnson must consider all of this while making inevitably unfavorable decisions. November 9, 1967. Captain Lance P. C. John's McDonnell Douglas F-4C Phantom Jet is crippled when his dropped payload detonates mere feet from the underside of his plane. He ejects. On his way down, he crashes into the trees near Vinh, North Vietnam. C. John awakens in pain. His right hand is crushed. His skull is fractured and his left leg is broken. After he is downed, American forces launch a search and rescue mission. So a patrol goes out, engages the VC, somebody gets wounded, the radio man calls in a chopper, medevac, okay? The medevac chopper comes in, dusts what we call dust off, dusts them off the battlefield, and takes them to the nearest facility. If it's, it could be in a VAC hospital, mass unit, or a clearing company. Their dust off was a medical evacuation helicopter unit, and uh, there were there were basically two different uh, nomenclatures. The first uh, cavalry division used medevac, and the difference would have been that medevac, uh, the aircraft, were armed uh, with offensive weapons, i.e., M60 uh, light machine guns mounted on board where with dust off, we went in unarmed, according to the Geneva Convention. We would uh, uh, fly in unarmed, and either if we could land, we would land and pick up the wounded, uh, regardless of whether the firefight was still going on or not. And if we couldn't land, we would either use a jungle penetrator, which was kind of like a three-pronged uh, fish hook that we would lower down into the jungle, or if the wounded uh, had a, a severe back or head injury, we would use a Stokes litter, which was the very same type of litter that they used during the Second World War and Korean War. It was basically a wire basket, and uh, we'd, we'd lower that down. And uh, while we were hovering as low as we could into the jungle, people on the ground would go and lo load the wounded into the Stokes litter. Once the patient was loaded onto that, we would uh, uh, hoist them up. And uh, uh, depending upon how heavy the fire was, We'd either stay at a hover while we were uh, hoisting them up, or we would go and uh, uh, start to take off uh, while the crew chief would be uh, hoisting them up. A search and rescue mission comes close to finding Sijan, even to his gaining visual contact with a rescue helicopter, but fails. Left alone in enemy territory, Captain C. John manages to survive and escape capture for six entire weeks in the unforgiving jungle. He is eventually found unconscious by North Vietnamese troops. After days, he escapes to be recaptured and then tortured. He is taken to the Hanoi Hilton, the main and worst of North Vietnamese prisoner of war camps. Captain C. John dies in the camp after contracting pneumonia. The downing of American pilots over enemy territory is very real in the war in Vietnam, as is the abuse during captivity. It's tough to prepare for something uh, when you don't know how long it's going to last. We'd gone to survival school, SEER school, survival escape, resistance and evasion. Uh, We'd gone to Sears school, and it's pretty realistic, except we knew in three days we'd be getting out and going back to the club or going back to the base. And uh, so you can't, you can't simulate 
day after day after day after day after day after day after day, not knowing when it's going to end. And um, that was the toughest part. We couldn't train for that. We trained for the torture. We trained for evading questions. We trained, trained for uh, just about everything. We did, they didn't teach us how to communicate covertly, which was, uh, uh, they do that now, but they didn't do it then. And uh, um, but the training was okay. Uh, but none of us was ever going to get captured. I mean, you think about getting killed, that, that went with the turf back then. Uh, um, being a Navy pilot was the, was the most dangerous job in the world. It was, it was more dangerous than uh, steeplejacks or, or uh, high steel workers. It was, uh, uh, we had a lot of accidents, operational accidents. More men, like Si John, will be taken by the North Vietnamese. These prisoners of war will endure pain beyond the war zone. Almost 300 miles north of Saigon and near the Cambodian and Laos borders, within the Khan Thung province, is the village of Dak To. Special Forces camps are established to keep a lookout for North Vietnamese and Viet Cong activity along this strategic point. The unforgiving terrain with high ridges and even triple canopy rainforests, make helicopter landings practically impossible. This is an advantage that enemy forces will use to their advantage. And they do. North Vietnamese soldiers begin attacking American outposts on a semi-regular basis by the middle of the year. 4th Infantry Division Commander, Major General William R. Pierce, requests reinforcements to go after the NVA troops. Two battalions arrive on June 17th from the 173rd Airborne Brigade and begin sweeping the area in Operation Greeley. June 20th, 1967. Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 503rd Airborne Infantry stumble across an entire Special Forces unit killed by the North Vietnamese. They continue on, bolstered by Alpha Company. At 0658, the morning of June 21st, Alpha Company is caught in a North Vietnamese ambush. Charlie Company rushes to their aid the best that they can, but are hampered by thick vegetation and the jungle terrain. Alpha Company is on their own. By battle's end, 76 of the 137 are killed with 23 wounded. Only 15 North Vietnamese dead are found on the battlefield. More U.S. forces are called into Dok Tho after the decimation of Alpha Company, and they arrive on June 23rd. Sheer numbers and superior firepower, they hope, will defeat the North Vietnamese. A three-day battle begins on August 4th, at a hilltop near Dak Seong, between a South Vietnamese airborne battalion and a North Vietnamese. The nearby Special Forces camp at Dak Seong also comes under North Vietnamese fire. The 8th Airborne comes in to help defend after the commander and his patrol fails to return. The missing patrol is found dead a kilometer away. The firefight with the North Vietnamese Army is eventually won through superior firepower and air support. In the aftermath, an entire PAVN headquarters is discovered at the top of the mountain where the bloodshed took place. The dwindling down of fighting by August 14th, with the assumption that the North Vietnamese have pulled back, leads to the end of what the U.S. call Operation Greeley. Quiet will not last long. November 3, 1967. The defection of a North Vietnamese artillery specialist to South Vietnam reveals the truth about enemy movement in Dak Tho. Months of preparation by the North Vietnamese are discovered, from trenches to bunkers. The communist plan is to divert as many Allied forces as they can to the Central Highlands area. 1,000 U.S. troops are bolstered with an extra 3,500 
from the U.S. 173rd Airborne Brigade and 4th Division. They will find themselves outnumbered and facing nearly 6,000 NVA troops. Dokto and its airstrip are now fortified, an important base in the Allied cause. Fighting begins when soldiers from the 4th Infantry encounter PAVN defensive positions and the 173rd do the same the next day. A pattern emerges. U.S. forces encounter North Vietnamese and the jungle warfare ends with more dead enemy troops than the already significant U.S. losses. But there are still losses. November 12, 1967. North Vietnamese forces begin firing barrages of rockets on the Dok Tho airstrip. Three days later, they destroy two C-130 Hercules transport aircraft on the runway, and the resulting fires and incoming artillery set off a chain reaction of explosions that last throughout the night. Two 40-foot deep craters are left in the wake of a giant mushroom cloud. It is, allegedly, the largest explosion in the Vietnam War. November 19th, 1967. The Battle of Doc Tho is about to come to a head. Intelligence indicates the enemy is positioned on an 875-foot hill a mere six kilometers from the border. The second battalion will take this hill. At 0943 hours, 330 men stand ready to take Hill 875. Charlie and Delta companies advance uphill with two platoons of Alpha Company behind them. Alpha's weapons platoon remain behind to cut a landing zone. The frontal assault is brazen, but hopefully unexpected by the enemy. At 10.30, the paratroopers walk into a barrage of machine gun fire. Then, B-40 rockets and artillery. Hidden in bunkers and trenches, the North Vietnamese are ready. They have been ready the entire time. Even Alpha Company, at the base of the hill, are ambushed by more PAVN troops and forced uphill sandwiched between North Vietnamese forces. Airstrikes are called in, but fail to have much effect because of the dense foliage. At 1858 hours, a Marine Corps fighter bomber lets loose a pair of 500-pound bombs. One of the bombs detonates in the center of the U.S. forces, killing 42 and wounding 45. Friendly fire incidents such as this who become all too commonplace during the war in Vietnam. Uh, I lost a good buddy that way. Um, he was hit by friendly artillery, and he knew it was going to happen because some of the officers weren't as competent as they should have been. And, uh, and that's what turned out that uh, the wrong coordinates were put in, and uh, now his name's up on the wall. Good friend. Later in the morning, a Cobra rolled on in and fired uh, up the area with his minigun and uh, overran our position and three of those rounds hit me and it also uh, overran, uh, you know, shot up our OJT uh, crew chief, uh, David Medina, and fatally wounded him. He ended up dying about 10 days later, I think. Three companies head out the next morning to relieve the overwhelmed forces on Hill 875. North Vietnamese fire keeps them from reaching the troops until nightfall. The next day, they advance into close quarters fighting with the North Vietnamese, but not reaching any further than the enemy trenches. The morning after that, more infantry is diverted from another offensive operation in the Central Highlands. Redeployed under the cover of night, they make it to the positions in Dok Tho within 12 hours. Realizing the need to deprive the North Vietnamese of jungle cover, November 23rd is full of airstrikes and artillery designed to denude the hilltop. 
As the U.S. troops attack Hill 875 in a renewed assault, they find an enemy already retreated. The costs are great. 376 U.S. troops are dead, with another 1,441 wounded. South Vietnamese forces lose 73 soldiers. For the North Vietnamese, they lose approximately 1,000 to 1,400. The Battle of Dok Tho is considered a military victory for American forces, something brought into question when balanced against the great losses. As 1967 ends, there are now 463,000 American troops in South Vietnam. 16,000 are lost in combat to date. Over one million soldiers have moved through the war in Vietnam in one year stints of service. With 90,000 more North Vietnamese troops gaining a foothold in South Vietnam, their army in Vietnam stands at 300,000 men. And so the war in Vietnam continues with the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong's machinations about to come to fruition in 1968. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.